think you'd do it. I didn't think you'd do it. You made me want you. All the time you knew it. All the time you knew it. You made me happy sometimes. You made me glad. But there were times still. Oh, I felt so bad. If you have a culture of millionaires, and, and they're all eminent, how do you achieve preeminence among eminence? And one of the ways that you sort out the layers of who's rich and who's not rich is what they can afford to do and with how much. And the yachts were one of the best examples of this. The bigger the yacht, the more lavishly it's furnished. Um, it is a floating party vessel in one sense. Not, uh, not just a pleasure boat, but a floating party vessel. But once society began to take over Newport, as it did on a grand scale in the 70s and 80s, and once the demand for yachts picked up, there was no yard in America that was more suited and more conveniently located for serving that market than the Herzog. But the men who bought these boats were also men who had made their fortune competing in business. And they were very competitive souls, and they liked to compete in everything. And the way their wives competed for social prominence, they competed whether they were playing polo, whether they were uh, in their yachts. And the second purpose of the yachts, therefore, was racing. It was not incompatible for someone of real money to have more than one yacht or to be part of a syndicate, as the America's Cups were, uh, to undertake support of a racing yacht. And it is a gentleman's sport, and it is a sport that only people with a lot of money can afford to engage in. Until 1891, John and Nat had been primarily engaged in building steam-powered craft. This was largely due to the success of Stiletto and some lucrative government contracts for torpedo boats. All that changed in 1891 with the yacht Gloriana. The wealthy industrialist E.D. Morgan, who had a summer cottage in Newport, rode his private train to Bristol to visit with John and Captain Nat. He went for sale with Captain Nat on a yacht named Clara that Captain Nat had built for himself in 1886. And he was so very impressed by the Clara that he then wanted to have a Harrisoff yacht, and he was the owner of the Gloriana. Gloriana belonged to a class of sailboats designed specifically for racing called 46-footers. Captain Nat broke all established rules of design and construction when he built the Gloriana. She was the first yacht of any prominence to have a cutaway bow profile for low wetted surface. She had an elegant uh, form and a beautifully uh, formed keel. And she had many new techniques of construction for lightweight. Spartan was built 21 years after Gloriana. But through her, we can learn of Captain Nat's revolutionary techniques for building strong, lightweight hulls. In boats of this design, the mast is generally pretty far forward. The mast, of course, is what heels the boat over when it's sailing. The lead ballast is comparatively further aft, and that's what keeps the boat from heeling over too much when you're sailing. So this, these offset forces tend to twist the hull. Now, hulls like this have a lot of wood going this way, transversely. They have a lot of wood going fore and aft. But when you twist something, you put diagonal stresses in it. Dealing effectively with these diagonal stresses is a large part of what allowed the Harrisoffs to build boats light. In other boats, they used big, heavy timbers, heavily caulked, inside ceiling that was heavy and heavily caulked to try to get enough friction between the planks to prevent the boat from distorting when it got twisted by the rig. In this boat, the boat was built with those stresses dealt with directly. Captain Nat was the first designer to incorporate diagonal metal straps set into the planking to prevent the hull from distorting. Besides Gloriana's lightweight hull, the Harrisoff's first racing yacht also incorporated an advanced sail design. She was the first boat to ever have another one of Captain Nat's innovations, cross-cut sails. Now those are sails where the fabric is arranged so that the cross threads of the fabric are aligned with the stresses of the sail along the leach. It's amazing that in 1891, 
Captain Nat was able to introduce so many pioneering innovations into a single yacht. And the result was that in this new class of so-called 46-footers of the New York Yacht Club, there were eight races, and the Gloriana won every race. She never lost a race. Dear Lewis, our brother Nat, whom we have always believed to be the ablest designer of the whole lot, and who has for 19 years been the field, is finally asked to frat the whole yachting world. He shapes out new lines and perfects many engineering novelties. And we soon behold the Gloriana as a representation of his skill. Soon the battle hour arises, the yachting world turns their eyes to Bristol and stand in respect. From that day when the Gloriana came out and was recognized as being such a breakthrough and from their great racing successes, all the good um, contracts for yachts came to the Herosos and it enabled them to then start this run of several decades where more prizes were won by Captain Nat's yachts during those next decades than by all the other yacht designers combined. A blind mathematician and trading virtuoso, running a 300 plus employee company, a design and engineering genius exploring cutting edge technologies and materials, John and Nat's was a unique partnership that was about to take the world by storm. No doubt, turned the Herosoft's name into a household word was their eight defenses of the America's Cup. At the turn of the century, the public's interest in the races for the Cup was very keen. Newspapers and magazines detailed all aspects of the event. We have pictures of crowds standing in front of the Providence Journal newspaper office here in Rhode Island, wherein bulletins were being posted every so often as to the progress of the race. And you could see in these pictures maybe 100, 200 people standing around like today people interested in an election would be standing. The colorful figures that were involved in the sport were part of the appeal. Men like Sir Thomas Lipton, who tried to win the cup five times. He made a name for himself, certainly with his five shamrocks, which raced in a period from 1899 to 1930. Five times he tried, five times he lost. Sir Thomas Lipton grew on the American public. He was such a gracious person, a gracious loser, that everybody felt sorry for him. He was an underdog from the word go. To my knowledge, other than having him pose on a boat every once in a while, he never sailed on one of his shamrocks. The New York Yacht Club, of course, was the, was the trustee of the cup all these years, and immediately they accepted a challenge. Some members would be canvassed to see whether or not they'd be interested in forming a, a syndicate. Undaunted by his two previous losses to Harrisoft boats, Lipton decided he would again challenge for the Cup in 1902. The call went out to build another defender. Now the key players in the um, Reliance Shamrock Three group were uh, Oliver Eisland, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and William Rockefeller. And those names certainly denote money. And they were the ones, along with about a half a dozen other people, most of whom were bankers or very professional people, directors of firms such as U.S. Steel, companies of that nature. In the fall of 1902, there was another challenge for the America's Cup and the order was given about the 1st of November. We had already taken order for an 86-foot schooner and the class of Bar Harbor 31-footers, beside the usual number of steamers, so our shop was quite full. Sir Thomas Lipton went to a shipbuilder in Scotland five times the size of Harrisov's for the construction of his Shamrock III. The Shamrock III was built by Denny's in Dumbarton, Scotland. Denny's was one of the largest shipbuilding firms on the Clyde River. One of the things that they had in their shipyard was a, a towing tank, which was practically unheard of in those days. Harrisoff did a lot of his work from hand carving models and building a boat from the lines taken off his little hand carved models.
Captain Nat's method of designing a hull was to hand carve a miniature model from a single block of wood. The lines would be then taken off of the model for the full size construction. Captain Nat carved the model for Reliance's hull in two nights, a much different approach than Shamrock III's designers, Fife and Watson. The Fife Watson combine used the test tank, which was one of the was the first time that a scientifically designed boat came out of the tank, that being Shamrock III. The Reliance was a giant boat, 144 feet long. She had a rig that was 200 feet above the water. And with a 19-foot draft, her keel weighed 90 tons. And in that great yacht, which in reality was a sort of a giant scow, very, very fast, uh, they also had the advantage of Captain Barr and a crew of 68. And that was, I think it's fair to say, the most spectacular of all America's Cup yachts then and now. He put in a most innovative rudder. This huge rudder, which was hollow, had, of course, a uh, space inside for either air or water. So Captain Nat fitted a uh, foot-driven air pump on the deck. If they wanted to modify the buoyancy of the rudder, somebody would, uh, with his foot, pump up the air. The air would go in the top of the rudder, drive the water out and it would, in effect, then uh, help resist the weather helm. And of course, he used an interesting combination of metals. The bottom was made of bronze, and the plating was uh, so skillfully uh, laid out and built that um, all the plates came together in their butts so that the joint had practically no uh, discontinuity. There was no putty or bond or anything on these hulls. And in fact, there was no paint on the bottom. They simply um, got a crew of 50 men to shine up the bottom before a race. So it must have been a beautiful sight, this gleaming bronze bottom. Then the top sides of uh, Reliance were built of steel, and her deck was built of aluminum plating. And all of this, of course, to get strength with light weight. She had the largest sail plan ever placed on a single mast. She had 16,700 square feet of working sail, and that entailed, of course, a tremendous mainsail and a main topsail, which was itself so large that that main topsail alone had more sail area than the mainsail and jib of a 12-meter boat. The spinnaker by itself was more than 10,000 square feet, and to give a sense of the size of that, the spinnaker pole was 84 feet long. 